If you're listening to this podcast on YouTube, for a better experience, switch to the video version. The link is in the top right corner of the video and in the episode description. Hello and welcome, I'm Fernando, a GP in the UK. Today, we're looking at the nice updates published in March 2024, focusing on what is relevant in primary care only. And in March, we have had a feast of new guidance, not because there have been many updates, but because of three completely new guidelines that have been published for the very first time. We will be covering managing genetic risk of ovarian cancer, bacterial meningitis and meningococcal disease, and the eagerly awaited vitamin B12 deficiency guideline. Right, so let's jump into it. So let's start with the guideline on identifying and managing genetic risk of ovarian cancer saying that these recommendations are for anyone who has a familial or genetic risk of ovarian cancer. This includes people with both female and male reproductive organs, because although people with male reproductive organs cannot develop ovarian cancer, they can pass the risk onto their children and may be at risk of developing other cancers. So, the brief summary for us is that in primary care, we should refer for genetic testing if they have a first or second degree relative with a diagnosis of ovarian cancer, a diagnosis of ovarian cancer themselves, they have already been identified to be at high risk, and if they are from an at-risk population, that is, those with at least one grandparent from the following populations, Ashkenazi Jewish, Sephardi Jewish, and Greenlander. As we know, the combined oral contraceptive reduces the risk of ovarian cancer, However, we will only give it to reduce the risk of ovarian cancer if the reduction in the ovarian cancer risk outweighs the increased risk of breast cancer. Equally, we can offer HRT until the average age of the menopause, usually around 51 years of age, for people who have not had breast cancer and have had bilateral salpingophorectomy. For those who have had breast cancer, HRT should be discussed with the breast cancer team. Now let's move to the guideline on bacterial meningitis and meningococcal disease, focusing on the recognition and diagnosis. This guideline does not cover infection in babies under 28 days of age, or people with immunodeficiencies, or any intracranial or spinal anomalies that increase the risk of meningitis. The difficulty that we have with the diagnosis of meningitis or meningococcal disease is that symptoms can be rapidly evolving and non-specific and they can be hard to distinguish from other infections, and therefore we should always consider giving safety netting advice. NICE has produced three long tables with signs and symptoms of when to suspect meningitis and meningococcal disease, both in children and adults. We will not go through them here, but I have created a summary that you can access in the episode description. But we should strongly consider meningitis when encountering the following red flag combination. Fever, headache, neck stiffness, and altered level of consciousness, including confusion and delirium. Also, we will really strongly suspect meningococcal disease if there is any of these red flag symptoms or signs. A hemorrhagic non-blanching rash with lesions larger than 2 mm, that is purpura, rapidly progressing and or spreading non-blanching petechial or purpuric rash, and any symptoms and signs of bacterial meningitis when combined with a non-blanching petechial or papyric rash. But on the other hand, we will not rule out meningococcal disease just because there is no rash. When looking for a rash, we will check all over the body, including the nappy areas, and check for petechia in the conjunctivae, particularly if the person has brown, black or tanned skin. There are a number of risk factors for bacterial meningitis and meningococcal disease, like, to name but a few, missed relevant immunizations, splenectomy, being a student in further or higher education, particularly if in large shared accommodation, and being in contact with someone with the disease, or having been in an area with an outbreak of meningococcal disease. We will obviously transfer people with suspected bacterial meningitis or meningococcal disease to hospital as an emergency, warning them that the patient is coming. But do we need to give antibiotics before sending the patient to hospital? 
Well, the things to consider in this respect are that, first of all, we should not delay admission to hospital to give antibiotics. Second, we will give them in suspected meningitis only if there's likely to be a clinically significant delay in the transfer. But we will always give them in suspected meningococcal disease unless this will cause a delay. And finally, if we give them, we will administer intravenous or intramuscular keftriaxone or benzalpenicillin unless there is a known and severe allergy to these drugs. Let's now look at the guideline on vitamin B12 deficiency, which is probably one that is very relevant in our day-to-day -day practice. Because it's so important, I think that the subject deserves its own dedicated episode. So we'll only give you a very quick overview here, just to give you a taste of what the guideline says. And to start, we will say that NICE does not use the term pernicious anemia in this guideline, but refers to autoimmune gastritis instead. And we also need to remember that people who have autoimmune gastritis are at higher risk of developing gastric neuroendocrine tumours and may also be at higher risk of developing gastric adenocarcinoma. So we will refer them for gastrointestinal endoscopy if they develop upper gastrointestinal symptoms. The guideline explains that we should not rule out vitamin B12 sufficiency just because there is no anemia or macrocytosis. We also need to be aware that vitamin B12 sufficiency can be associated with mental health problems, including depression, anxiety and psychosis. We will test vitamin B12 levels depending on the symptoms and risk factors, including gastrointestinal surgery, autoimmune medical conditions and medication taken. To diagnose vitamin B12 deficiency, we can use total B12 levels, that is, serum cobalamin. But in certain circumstances, we will need to test for active B12, that is, zero holotranscobalamin, plasma hosmocysteine, or serum methylmalonic acid, or MMA. In order to identify the cause of vitamin B12 deficiency, we will consider testing for anti-intrinsic factor antibodies if autoimmune gastritis is suspected, bearing in mind that a negative result does not rule it out. If it is still suspected despite a negative anti-intrinsic factor antibody test, we will consider further investigations including anti gastriparietal cell antibodies or even a gastroscopy with biopsy. And we should consider testing for celiac disease where the cause of deficiency remains unknown. In terms of managing vitamin B12 deficiency, we will give lifelong vitamin B12 injections if autoimmune gastritis is the cause or they have had a total gastrectomy or a complete terminal ileal resection. For other causes of malabsorption, dietary problems, for medication-related deficiencies and nitrous oxide use, we can use either intramuscular or oral vitamin B12 replacement, based on our clinical judgment. During follow-up, we will not check vitamin B12 levels if we're giving vitamin B12 injections, but we will be guided by symptoms instead. If the symptoms have not improved enough, we will increase the frequency of injections if needed and think about alternative diagnoses. If a person has an irreversible cause, we will continue with lifelong injections even if the symptoms have disappeared. However, if the symptoms have disappeared and the reversible cause has been resolved, we will think about stopping or reducing the vitamin B12 replacement, advising them to come back if symptoms recur. NICE has produced a two-page visual summary on ongoing care and follow-up options for oral and intramuscular vitamin B12 replacement, and the link to it is in the episode description. We have come to the end of this episode. Remember that this is not medical advice, and it is only my summary and my interpretation of the guidelines. You must always use your clinical judgment. Thank you for listening, and goodbye.